You know, fans of the On The Mark podcast, I adopt a very holistic approach to the improvement of golf. You know, when Dr. Spiegel and his crew reached out to me, I was like, we have never done this before. So with that being said, Dr. Spiegel, Dr. David Spiegel, if I may, um, welcome to this On The Mark podcast. How are you doing? Thank you very much, Mark. I'm, I'm doing fine. Okay. Thanks for having um, me. My pleasure. Truly my pleasure. Okay. Your list of achievements, <clears throat> accolades and stuff are lengthy. And if I had to read all of them out, um, we'd take yeah. up about 20 minutes. So I'm just going to tee you off with folks to say that you're a professor and the chair of psychiatry and behavioral science, the Wilson Associate chair. At BC. Associate chair. Yes. Um, you're at Stanford University. You've written That's countless right. books, uh, journal <laughs> entries, everything about you know, well-being and obviously hypnosis. So with that little introduction, would you please tell the people about yourself? Sure. Um, well, I'm very glad to be here with you. Uh, I have been for the last half a century doing research and clinical work on the phenomenon of hypnosis and related mind-body issues, stress and health. I run a center on stress and health at Stanford. I'm a practicing psychiatrist, um, and uh, as well as a researcher, and have used hypnosis with uh, about 7,000 uh, patients and clinical research subjects in my career. So I know a fair amount about hypnosis, what it does. We've studied it in the brain, what it does in the brain when you go into a hypnotic state. And so we understand a lot more about how it works, and we know a lot more that it works. And so what I am trying to do in uh, building this uh, Reverie app, which is a digital interactive self-hypnosis app, is make that available to everyone. Because Mark, I, I have been deeply more and more frustrated in the course of my career at how such a useful natural phenomenon is underutilized and disrespected. Uh, and I want to change that. I want people to use it to, to play better, to live better, to sleep better, to work better. Um, and it is a valuable tool. And if you consider the fact, you know, athlete golf is not an injury prone sport, but um, athletes um, get injured all the time. And we have lost in the United States, 88,000 people last year to opioid overdoses alone. Yeah. The CDC is expecting 111,000 this year. Hypnosis is a very effective pain reliever. It is very effective for managing stress. Uh, and we have not succeeded in killing anyone yet using hypnosis. So um, it's an undervalued commodity that really deserves more attention. And that's why I have built an app with my colleagues at Reverie to, so that people can have me sitting on their shoulder in their smartphone, um, helping them better control body and mind. Well, if folks are interested, uh, we'll talk about the app in just a little while. Um, sure. I watched a YouTube post of Dr. Spiegel um, hypnotizing Andrew Huberman, who a lot yes. of us know, and, and I was fascinated. So I guess I'll kick it off with this. Um, you know, I was always, when I would see hypnosis on television, I'd be like, oh, wow, cool. And then I'd be like, shucks, I don't know if I want to go into this altered state for, right. for, for lack of a better descriptor. But then I thought about it more and I was like, but wait a second. You know, if I have a few glasses of wine or if I take medication or whatever the case might be, altered states are happening inside where, so, so I want you to describe the mechanics. What is hypnosis in indeed for folks, please? Sure. Um, and you're absolutely right. We all seek altered states and enter them from time to time. Hypnosis is a state of highly focused attention. Yeah. It's like getting so, have you ever gotten so caught up in a good movie that you kind of forgot you were watching the movie and entered the imagined world? Really? And, you know, later on, you may think about it and say, well, you know, this didn't quite make sense and so on. But at the time, you're just in it. Hypnosis has been called believed in imagination. Yeah. And people who get, you ever get lost in a sunset, you know, just get surrounded by the beauty of it and, and lose awareness of everything else. That's a hypnotic state. And people um, who are more highly hypnotized will have more experiences like that. So it's highly focused attention. It's like looking through the telephoto lens of a camera, which you see, you see with great detail, but you're less aware of the surroundings. Now, in order to do that, to focus that intently, which good golfers have to do, um, you need to be able to put aside things that normally might distract you. And as a simple example, Mark, 
right now you're having sensations in your body touching the chair you're sitting in, but hopefully you were not even aware of them until I mentioned it. If you were, we could stop the interview right now. Um, so our brains are very good. Is that, am I right about that? You just, yeah, absolutely. The sensations you know, there, but you yeah. weren't feeling it. It's, it's, it's automatic, you know, and, and it's funny you talk about this because my goal for this year was to be more present you know, because there's always something to achieve and something to get to in a list. And all of a sudden I find myself at day's end having blown through everything and not everything right. got my, my myopic view of the, of the circumstance and honestly got the attention it deserved. That's, that's exactly right. And so we can be jumping from thing to thing and never fully present in any one of them. And hypnosis it's a little bit like flow states where you're just in it. You know, you're just totally engaged and absorbed in it. It tends to be very pleasurable. It's it's self-reinforcing because you feel better when you're fully connected with your body and fully focused on doing one thing that has meaning for you. So we've got absorption and hypnosis. We've got dissociation, putting outside of conscious awareness things that would ordinarily be in consciousness in order to be so absorbed. The third part is the thing that scares people the most and the thing that needs to be debunked the you know the suggestibility thing you know the, the dangle the watch and you'll do anything i want or in that terrible movie get out you know she clinks on the teacup and the guy's head falls and all that all hypnosis is really self-hypnosis and what suggestibility is is really cognitive flexibility so when if you've been to you know one of these awful hypnosis stage shows and you've seen the football coach dancing like a ballerina making a fool of himself there is an embedded message there and the message is not that this guy on the stage can make anybody do anything they want because they can't but it is that you can try out being different so pair that image of the, the football coach dancing like a ballerina with the idea that in hypnosis, you can try out being a different person and see what it feels like. So rather than having to talk yourself into it or understand why you got there, just try it out, see what it feels like. Mm -hmm. And and that can be true for your concentration in golf too, that you can, you know, you're sort of anxious and you're always worried about the guy behind you and what your score is going to be. That's a good way to sabotage yourself. But if you can say, I'm going to try being like Tiger, you know, who in the the most ungodly pressure can just walk onto the stage with uh, onto the, the green with this half smile on his face and calmly walk up and make this amazing shot. And so his capacity to be in for what he wants to be in for and out for everything else is part of his training in self-hypnosis. It's, it's your way of making a choice about what you want to focus on and becoming the kind of person who can do that. It's, you know, you stimulate so many things in my mind when you share that anecdote. And I want to talk about Tiger because I've had the luxury of announcing him, calling him, watching him from the front row seat in the midst of his um, golf tournaments. Um, but first off, as you share all of that, I think of the word control. You know, because mm -hmm. a lot of us, maybe it's ego driven, whatever the case might be, but we get the sense that, hold on, I've got to give up control. But everybody watching this or listening to this wants to be a better golfer, by definition, a different golfer. And what you say there is so appropriate because to take that next step, you've got to leave the other behind. It's like leaving first base to steal second. And this is... <laughs> True, true. I, I mean, like this is my my like layman's anecdote, my layman's analogy. That's good. That's a good um, one. Yeah. And what you say is right because people want to get better, but that means you're going to do something, and everyone's making it physical, and I'm in control. Where yet it's just going to the the supercomputer, the 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 control center of it all. Absolutely right. Control begins at home. It begins inside you, and this little three pound organ we have sitting on our shoulders is our major evolutionary advantage, you know, other than the opposing thumb, it's what allowed us to survive, take over and desecrate the planet. And it's um, the, to the extent that you can focus on what your goal really is, put a, put aside distractions and try out what it would be like to be the kind of person who can do that. And you look at Tiger, he, he's not, he's not losing control. He's in control. And it's a matter of deciding on, focusing on, and allowing yourself to give yourself to the tasks that you want to accomplish and to relate to your body in such a way that it can do it. 
that is what hypnosis helps you to do. So you're not losing control. You're making control. You're enhancing it. You're telling your brain and your body, this is what I want to focus on. This is how I want to relate to my body. Uh, I, I will not let myself get distracted by anything else. And I will just um, uh, be the kind of person who can do that. I, I was asked by the coach of the Stanford. Stanford has a wonderful women's swimming team. They're really good. Populate the Olympics a lot. Um, and the coach noticed that his his strongest swimmers were doing better in practice than they were in meets. Now, it's normally you think, golf, you know, really, is that right? That okay. yes, that they, and, and that's a matter of focusing on the wrong thing. And the, and the message there is basically focus on the process, not the goal, not the outcome, mm -hmm. because what you do when you focus on the outcome is you're disconnecting from your body and your control of your body. So what I had the women swimmers do, we did a group hypnosis session was picture themselves just swimming their best race, but not, not in a meet, just you're in the lane do. And, you know, swimming is not a contact sport, you know, it really doesn't matter what the woman in the next lane is doing. What matters is what you're doing. So focus on what matters. And I had them focus on their relationship with their body, how they interact with their body in such a way that it feels good to be swimming as well as they can. The rhythm of the strokes, where you pull, where you kick, how much, how you how you plan for the turn, how you do it, so that they're enjoying the experience of making the most of their body and using it well and not worrying about what the time is. And you know what? Their times got better because they did not allow themselves to be distracted by what was going on in the lanes next to them. Okay. And that's the kind of thing that I am sure, I, I have no personal experience of it, but I am sure that that's what Tiger does. I understand that he does a kind of self-hypnosis and plans every every swing and does it before and then um he's done fairly well doing it i would say so i you know i get the image of just throwing off everything that hinders us when you share the the anecdote of the the lady swimmers um with regard to tiger you know when i've been out there inside the ropes with them at the very highest of levels it almost seems like you can look at him at times and he appears like he's in the <laughs> zen like state like he'll look at me, but almost look yeah. through me. And I right. was on a, a show here recently and they asked, it was like a celebration of Tiger. And they asked, you know, a bunch of us just talk about, they, they would give a record of his and then asked us, ask us to opine. And I was like, the thing about Tiger is that he appears like when the moment happens, the man shows up. You know, when, when, every shot's worth one, but Tiger... <clears throat> Could sense that there were shots that just meant something more and he would be there and he would deliver it was an uncanny ability so i guess my story ends with a question is the self-hypnosis can you switch it on and switch it off and switch it on and switch it off or is he in this sort of state throughout the round yeah no you can switch it on and switch it off and i think what you're pointing out mark is he was not, you know, focusing on the long game picture of what will it mean if I win this tournament or not. He's focused on that moment, on how I have to be with my body so that we connect and do what we need to do right here, right now. It's And, and when he's looking through you, he's saying, you're a nice guy, Mark, but, <laughs> you know, I, I, I'm, I'm not here to build a relationship with you. I'm here to make this play work. And so it's it's a matter of as you narrow the focus of attention, you put outside of it things that you may have to do something about, but that are not crucial to the way because what matters is how he relates to his body and how his body works um, when he takes that next shot. Yeah. And so the capacity to filter out everything else and 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 just be present for what you need to do is I think his way of maximizing and optimizing what he does. And it's why he can look so glacially calm and seem, uh, you know, focused, but not necessarily focusing on you, focusing on what he needs to pay attention to. And that's a tremendous talent that he's making very good use of. I would argue, and I'm sure you would agree that every great achiever gets to this place. Um, we, I want to talk to you about the health benefits of hypnosis too, but I'll sure. never forget, it's almost burned into my memory. My career in broadcast began with radio. 
And I was up in the PGA Tour radio studios at Sirius XM in Washington, D.C. And along the mm. walls, they had these big black and white pictures of Janis Joplin and Bruce Springsteen. And there was a picture of um, Jimi Hendrix. Mm. The, the photographer had caught this image, and I get goosebumps describing it, where he's obviously the auditorium is packed to the rafters. You cannot see that. But this picture is on him, and you can see the guitar, and you can see him with a microphone in front, just looking into the distance. And I was, I was drawn in by this because you could just see he was like 100% there. He was in yeah. his moment, doing his mm -hmm. thing, and not worried about what was going on around him. That's very, yeah, he was in his purple haze. That's, uh, that <laughs> there was, you go. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, that, yeah. That's what it is. In fact, the old color hypnotist used to wear was purple. It's kind of interesting, actually. Okay. Um, but yes, and, and, but there, it's interesting. There's something sort of magnetic about it, isn't it? You, you see somebody like that and they, the, the crowd could sense that I'm sure that he was engaged in the experience of making the music and the sound and not, Oh, this is good. We got a good turnout here, you know, more than 10,000 people. And, you know, it, none of that. It's like, and, and there is something very attractive about that. Good actors do that too. They just, you know, they're there you tell them you, you that was terrific and they sort of don't know what you're talking about because they were that person yeah they become the person they're playing and and it's that capacity to give yourself and to be different and and maybe i can explain a little uh mark about what goes on in the brain when people are hypnotized that might help further flesh out what Jimi hendrix was undoubtedly going through in that photo um there are three things that happen and we've taken high and low hypnotizable people, given them hypnotic and non-hypnotic instructions, put them in the fMRI, the, the magnetic resonance imaging scanner, and we can determine where activity is happening in their brains. Right. And three things happen. One, you turn down activity in the anterior cingulate cortex, the dorsal part of the anterior cingulate. Now the, the cingulate cortex is like a C on its ends right in the middle of your brain. Right. And the front part is what we call the salience network. It's kind of the alarm system of the brain. It does pattern matching. And if something happens, if you hear a loud noise and it pulls your attention away, that's that part of your brain saying, you better look out. There might be something bad going on out there. Um, and if you turn down activity in that part of the brain, it frees you to focus more intently. So just like you're saying, you know, Tiger could see you and say hello, but he wasn't really focusing on you. He wasn't letting you distract him from what he needed to be doing, which was connecting with his body and planning his next shot. Um, and so that's a crucial part. And one thing you should know about this part of the brain is that it, it, it is rich in what inhibitory neurotransmitter called GABA, gamma aminobutyric acid. Uh -huh. It's a transmitter that... Um, is affected by most anti-anxiety drugs like halprazolam mm -hmm. um, uh, and clonopin and others. It it so it's it inhibits this kind of arousal. You've got your own little hypnopharmacy in your brain there. So if you need more of it, it will secrete it and bind to receptors mm -hmm. that calm you down. You can do it internally, and and so highly hypnotizable people have more of those receptors that can bind to um, to GABA. So you soothe yourself and don't worry so much. So part of Tiger's glacial calm is this capacity to just turn down that part of his brain and not let him get distracted. The second is hyperconnectivity, high functional connectivity between the executive control network in the front of the brain, um, the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, and a part of the brain called the insula. Insula is Latin for island. It's a little island of neural tissue in the middle of the front of your brain. And it's the mind-body conduit. So it's a part where the brain controls the body. And the brain gets what's called interoception. It gets signals from the body how it's doing. Do you feel good or not? Your GI system, comfortable or uncomfortable? Um, we've been able to show that in hypnosis, people can control in two directions the secretion of gastric acid which you have to do if you're going to if you eat a meal only we had people hypnotized eating imaginary meals and they got an 89 percent increase in their gastric acid secretion we'd spend an hour doing a gastronomic tour of the bay area and i swear one woman halfway through said let's stop i'm full 
just <laughs> eating imaginary food. <laughs> and and then we had them do the opposite. Picture anything relaxing, being on a beach in the tropics somewhere, anything except food or drink. And they had a 39% decrease in their gastric acid secretion. So then my colleague, uh, the gastroenterologist, who was uh, had an NG tube down and was recording the gastric acid, said, let's try this. We injected them with pentagastrin, which is a natural hormone that causes the stomach to secrete more gastric acid. And even when we did that, we in the hypnosis condition, we had a 19% decrease in gastric acid. Mm -hmm. Now, you wouldn't think you could do this. So this is a level of control and sensation in your body that we don't even think we have. And that is enhanced in hypnosis. You can enhance your brain's ability to connect with your body, to read what's going on in your body and to control it. The third thing, um, and in some ways the most interesting, is inverse functional connectivity between the, the prefrontal cortex and the back of the cingulate cortex, the default mode network, it's the posterior cingulate. The default mode is the part of your brain that sort of identifies who you are and what you are and what people think of you. It's um, when you're not doing anything and you start reflecting, who am I? Have I achieved what I want to achieve? Do people respect me? Do they like me? Do they not like me? That's the default mode. And you just shut that down. Hmm. That's where the cognitive flexibility comes. Mm -hmm. And that's where Tiger can just say, you know, I don't care what you think of me. I don't care what the sports writers are going to write about me tomorrow. I'm in myself. I'm the kind of person who gives primary focus right now to how I am relating to my body yeah. and what that next shot needs to be and how I'm going to do it and and connecting with your body. There's a, there's a book called Zen and the Art of Archery in which a... Uh, uh, a man who was observing how how people practice Zen wrote that the mistake people make in in archery is they focus too much on the target. Now you think, well, what the hell else are you going to focus on? He says, here's what you're going to focus on: your relationship with the bow and arrow. That's what really matters. And if your relationship with the bow and arrow is right, you will hit the target. Mm -hmm. um, but if you're focusing just on the target, you're not paying attention to what actually matters, which is how your body interacts with the bow and arrow. And the same is true with golf and with other sports, that you want to be in the right relationship with the club, um, with the tennis racket, whatever it is, and then you will, you will succeed. Um, but it's not by focusing on the goal or what it'll mean if you win this thing. That's distracting yourself. So um, those are the three things that happen in the brain with hypnosis. Fascinating. Um, you, you mentioned the relationship with a golf club or the tennis racket or, you know, the bow and arrow. And I've been as an instructor and a coach, you can accuse me of saying to folks, you need to focus more. You need to be more purpose driven, you know, because in golf, we, we, there's this funny thing where our value is defined by how well we get the ball to the target and how few strokes we take. So that occupies all of the attention, but then you've got this implement in your hand that's designed to propel the golf ball to the target, and we completely lose um, any sort of awareness of it. And then you make the swing, you think in positive, all these grand intentions, but the ball flies off into kingdom come. So, so what you say there to me, I'm like, yes. And I can see now why a Tiger Woods, when that moment was at its greatest, you can see him just lock in, and it's like the club becomes an extension of him. It's That's like just exactly tossing a ball, it. you know, something very normal. He's he's relating to his body and his body to the club and nothing else matters. And that's exactly right. If you start thinking about what it'll mean if you miss it, you're going to miss it. <laughs> um, or even if you're focusing on what it'll mean if you get it, you're still disconnecting your brain from its control of your body. That's what matters. That's what you're doing. And so I understand he mentally rehearses each swing before he takes it. Um, there, uh, the, uh, there's a story about the Olympic uh, ski team uh, at the Sochi Olympics, which that bastard Putin decided had to be in Sochi, even though they had virtually no snow. Um, it was terrible experience for the skiers because they could only do one practice run. There was so little snow that they didn't want to degrade the slope. So Bode Miller and the other members of the Olympic team would get up to the top of the of the run, stand there, look at it, and mentally make every turn, every move they had to make all the way down. And the U.S. team did extremely well. 
in that under terrible adverse circumstances. And, and there are, I know stories of, uh, uh, you know, people who do, uh, you know, parallel bars and, and, uh, and those kinds of uh, events in the Olympics who, if they get an injury, which they often do, will still go to the gym every day and just sit there and mentally rehearse what they will do when they heal, when their bodies get better and they do better. They do better because they're doing the mental programming, even if they can't do the physical programming. And we know, by the way, that neurons that fire together, wire together. So you're building pathways in your brain uh, to to do what you need to do. It's not simply a mental exercise. It's a mental neurological exercise where you're also preparing your brain to to follow those paths and be in better control of your physical activity. You know what I love there? I'm writing it down. Neurons that fire together, wire together. Um, yeah. Because we can get so physically aware, like when I've gone to my golf teacher for a lesson and he or she has told me to do this and that, and it becomes very mechanical. Uh, instead yeah. of look thinking upon this, where it's basically signals from the mind to the neuro that the neurons travel into the muscles and you are rewiring pathways to make this right. habitual change because if you're not completely engaged and I'm now making a statement to get your take, really it's like, you know, kind of spitting into the wind because you're not, you, you, you might be in it, but you're not in it. If, if you know what I'm saying mentally. Well, you know, you're, you're sending your body mixed messages when you do that. And it's a little bit, you know, one way I ask people to help their bodies in lots of ways is to think of their body as if it were their child. Uh, because your body is as dependent on you as, as your child is or was. And, you know, children know very quickly when you're distracted, when you're really paying attention to something else. Mm -hmm. And they need your connection to be happy doing whatever it is they're doing. And your body is like that, that, that if you're paying attention, yeah, yeah, I got to get through this next shot, but I, but, you know, then there are two more that are more difficult and, and then there's this guy giving me dirty looks and, you know, you're distracting and your body will react the same way your kid does when you're not giving them your full attention. So it, it's a, it's a, it, think of caring for your body uh, as you practice getting your body to do what you want it to do. I want to ask about the health aspect of it too, because you said a, a lot of club golfers, even professional golfers, the game's changing. It's more athletic. And so there's more stress put on the body and folks are suffering with health issues and, and hips and backs and stuff like that in the game. So I want to talk about the healing of it because I believe in that. But you made a statement earlier that caught my attention. Um, you mentioned if someone was highly hypnotizable. Right. So it begs the question, are there folks that are averse to being hypnotized? Is there such a thing? Well, it's not so much averse. It's not an attitude. You know, we're, we're not blaming the subject. If, if Some people are just not hypnotizable. And I, the first thing I do with every patient I see is measure their hypnotizability. It takes about five minutes. Mm -hmm. And it's that, that, that YouTube with Andrew Huberman. Uh, I was testing his hypnotizable, and I just love that. And if you want to get a kick, watch this, because here you see this brilliant, bearded, tough guy <laughs> uh, who is sympathetic to hypnosis. We've done collaborative research together. He's a terrific guy. But, but I'm testing his hypnotizability and the instruction and part of it is your hand will feel light and buoyant float up in the air. If I pull it down, it'll float right back up to the upright position. And you see him looking at his hand like, what the hell is going on here? Because he said, he said it, it, wasn't, it, like it wasn't a part of his body. It was crazy. Yeah, exactly. It feels, it feels dissociated. That's exactly right. And it's got like a mind of its own, you know, it's doing what it wants to do. And I just love that look of amazement on his face when he's doing that. Um, and that's what some people can do more easily than others. And it's not a matter of resistance or a bad attitude about 20% of adults are just not very hypnotizable. 20% are extraordinarily hypnotizable. They're just in it most of the time. Their problem is you know, not getting into hypnotic states, but staying out of them. And the majority, about 60%, uh, are moderately hypnotizable. So they'll have the experience, but then they'll reflect and wonder, what is this like? Am I really doing it right? And then they'll get back into it. Mm -hmm. Hypnotizability in adult life is as stable a trait as IQ. It just doesn't change very much. And 
there are biological reasons for that and there are developmental reasons for it. So uh, biologically, we found a genetic variation that is associated with higher hypnotizability. It has to do with a, a gene, catechol o methyltransferase. It's a gene um, that is involved in dopamine metabolism. Okay. And if you have the right amount of dopamine in your brain at all times, uh, dopamine populates a lot of the frontal part of the brain, you can access hypnotic responsiveness more easily. And we actually have developed a point of care test for that variant, uh, the valine methionine variant of the COMT gene that we could measure. I mean, I can do it behaviorally, but we can actually measure biologically whether you're genetically more likely to be hypnotizable. Um, and there are also developmental reasons. Um, people who uh, whose parents engaged in imaginative involvements, told kids a lot of stories, read them stories when they went to sleep, enjoy going to that place of intense focus and using their imaginations. And by the way, all eight-year-olds are in trances all the time. And, you know, as you know, if you call your eight-year-old in for dinner, they don't hear you. They're out playing. And it's why childhood is so year old is like that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Hanging on to his hypnotizability. Um, it, it, it's, uh, you know, work and play are all the same for kids. It's a shame we try to make them into little adults because they, their imagination gets all in commingled with what it is they're learning. It's a wonderful time of life. And most children in that age period are very hypnotizable. But as we develop adult cognition, where we value reason more and, and emotion less, um, some of us lose some of that hypnotic ability. The other path is is a less pleasant one, and that is that children who have been mistreated in one way or another often use it as an escape from an unpleasant reality, and they can't let go of it. So it's it's got positive and negative sources in the background. But um, people's hypnotizability, it's not a matter of resisting or not trying. It's some people have more ability than others. And it's a matter, we have a test on reverie, where in five minutes you can find out whether you're a high, a poet, a mid-range, a diplomat, or low uh, researcher. Um, and that just guides you in how you will use it. It doesn't mean you can't get benefit, but you do it in different ways. I feel like, look, I have not been hypnotized. Maybe I, I'm, I'm sure I've had moments because I can stare at a sunset and, and have tears in my eyes. And and so, I, I mean, I can get so right. into through this thing because it elicits all these emotions within so I, I want to say, and maybe I'm just being a salesperson here, given that we are beings with purpose and everyone's wondering what their purpose is, being in the state where we just basically free to be whoever, I, I'm sure that it's, it's exhilarating to, to be there and, and, to, and then the after experience. So that's my question. So whilst you're being hypnotized, and afterwards, what what is the feeling? I'm fascinated. Well, it, it it's one of those things that's, you know, I, it's similar to what's been described as a flow state where just being there is its own reward. You know, you're not being there to do something else. You're being there just because it's fun to be there. Or when, you know, if you've had a moment of excitement in some work you're doing and you realize you've been doing it for two hours and you missed an appointment and you just you were so into it that, it, it it is <laughs> it is self reinforcing. It's just uh, it, it's just fun to be there. And by the way, you're usually very productive and doing interesting things. So uh, yeah, I see you waving your hand, and you, you you've been there, you've done that, and and it's great. It's it's a moment of kind of internal harmony, where your brain and your body are together, and you're just focusing on on being somewhere you like to be, on doing something you like to do, and doing it well. And it's its own reward. And by the way, if you win a tournament, great. But you you would do it just to be in that state and enjoy the sense of harmony between your, your brain and your body. Yeah, I, I can certainly concur there because as an instructor, when I watch people, let's just talk very golfy here and say there's a pre-shot routine where you put things in place to give the upcoming shot the best chance of success. And I've seen people autopilot their way through there where they're kind of switched off and they're just doing what they've been taught to. And then I can watch folks who are in their routine where it's like you can see that they're completely given up to this process of 
you know, breathing appropriately and making your rehearsal swing and then almost becoming what's about to happen. Yes. Because I see, because I see so many golfers where I've done this with a client and it, it's now improving. I'm guessing it's, you would agree where every day, instead of hitting balls, I want them just to make 100 swings, just free flowing. Yeah. Because yeah. there was a certain hit impulse where, you know, when I'm going to hit something, they react. It's like the, the, the sniper, I'm sure. And it's amazing how just making these swings and not being concerned about the contact and what might happen, how all of a sudden it's been liberating and it's opening up this avenue of development. Does, does that make but sense? See, absolutely. What you're teaching them is to be in sync with the process and not worry about the outcome. Yeah. When you're having them swing, you're disconnecting it from the outcome. It's not It's not where the ball goes. It's your relationship with the club and how you swing and how your body connects with it. So you're teaching them to focus on the process rather than the outcome. Incredible. Um, what would you say to the folks? I think I know the answer, but I just must ask this because I'm listening to you like a fan. I'm listening to you like I'm sitting in one of your, your classrooms right now. Um, <laughs> I just get to ask all the questions. Um, Great. The... I'm certain folks are listening to this going, wow, that's cool. I've got to get the Reverie app, but oh my goodness, I'm kind of nervous of this and I'm apprehensive and I'm just not sure because again, we, we relinquishing a certain amount of control. What's your message? Yeah, I'd say try it. You'll like it. And if you don't like it, you can stop. I mean, that's a real advantage of hypnosis over any drug. And I prescribe meds. I'm a doctor, but um, you, you can turn it on. You can turn it off. All hypnosis, uh, Mark, is really self-hypnosis. Um, and so all I'm doing is showing you how to identify, mobilize, and utilize an ability that you have to the extent that you have it. And I, I will say that most people are surprised themselves mm -hmm. at, at what they can do and how they feel. I had a I saw for the first time a lovely young woman yesterday, 24 years old, uh, who has a genetic disease that uh, limits the the amount of cartilage she has in her joints, especially her knees. And so now she's about out of cartilage. She's going to have to have major surgery to try and repair it. She's in pain all the time because it's bone on bone in her knees. And um, she uh, had never tried hypnosis before. And I said, well, I want you to imagine in hypnosis being where you get some physical relief. So she said, yeah, a warm bath usually helps. Okay. And so I had her hand up in the air, tingling and numb and imagining being in the bath, feeling the warmth penetrating. And her pain at the beginning was two to three out of 10. It wasn't terrible, but she wasn't walking around at the time. And um, she said, I'm feeling the warmth. And, you know, my left knee is feeling better now. And I said, now let your hand spread some of that tingling numbness to your knees and she rubbed them and by the end she said the pain is gone i can't believe it i don't have pain now and you know she's still going to get the knee surgery but just the feeling that she is not sort of sentenced to being in pain all the time uh, because part of it part of pain is your brain's expectation of what's going to happen when you do something that you know usually hurts that's the, what the brain is supposed to do Mm -hmm. But it once you know what it is, you know, you haven't just broken your ankle, you know that there's something going on and you can handle it and you're not making it worse by using the limb. Um, you don't need to have an accurate recall of what usually happens when you walk. Mm -hmm. And so she's now walking around feeling better. People can do that without drugs. So it's it's a something you can try and see if it helps. If it does, we're finding with Reverie that you know, four out of five people, the first time they use it, feel a reduction in pain. Uh, they feel a reduction in stress. They they get to sleep. And you'll know right away. You know, try it. You'll like it. If you don't, uh, you can stop. Um, so it's uh, it's one of those things where it's a way of trying on a new skill and seeing what it would be like if you were the kind of person who could actually regulate uh, how much discomfort you feel. You know, I'm a believer or I'm, I'm becoming more of because, you know, way back when you hear the things were well, like, we only use a portion of our brain, right? Which is incorrect, but, but we're not really right. using our brain like you teaching us right now. And then, and then I also believe that the body will heal itself or the mind, you know, that's the power of the mind. Um, because I sit here, I've a fit, yeah, youngish 53 man battling high blood pressure for the longest time. 
and you come mm -hmm. at me with blood pressure cuff and I can feel my system ramping up. And the doctor's like, well, that's white coat syndrome. And I'm like, right. all very well. How do I get rid of that? And, and I'm yeah. listening to you now. I'm like, yeah. I, think I have my answer. So this is very serendipitous. That's, that's exactly right. Well, tell him to take off his coat, but no, the, <laughs> the, no, it, but that's exactly right. It is in, a, in essence, the white coat is a signal to you that you're about to be examined in a way that will make you feel even more anxious because your blood pressure will go up and guess what it does. So expectation will have that effect. And what we do in hand, teaching people how to handle stress is not from the top down, but from the body up. So, you know, if you're facing a stressor, how do you know you're being stressed? Well, your brain says, oh, this could be trouble. But then immediately your body reacts to that. So the white coat syndrome, here's this guy with a blood pressure cuff. I'm going to find out that my heart's in worse shape than I thought. <laughs> so your blood pressure goes up, your muscles tense, you start to sweat. And then what happens? What happens next, Mark? My mind goes. <laughs> yeah. Right, because you notice it. You say, yeah. oh my God, this must be really bad because my body feels terrible. And then your body says, uh-oh, he's getting anxious now. And it's like a snowball. I call it a snowball effect. So what we do is interrupt that from the body up. Say the first thing you're going to do is learn how to make your body more comfortable. It's like that idea of treating your body like a child. Yeah. So you soothe it. You know, if your body, if you're upset, your kid's upset, what you do, you soothe him. You don't get angry or frustrated with him. You soothe him. Soothe your body. Imagine in hypnosis, you're floating in a bath, a lake, a hot tub, or floating in space. Taking in a, a breath and then slowly exhale, several slow exhales, what we call it a cyclic sigh, which helps you trigger parasympathetic activity, get your body floating. And then only then with your body safe and comfortable, picture what it is that's worrying you. And you picture it on an imaginary screen, but out there, not inside your body. And then you think, well, what can I do about this? You know, it doesn't have to be the right answer, but let me just think of a solution. So you've already calmed your body you've enabled your, your body to stay calm while you're picturing something that makes you anxious. And you're able to think more freely about what you might do about it. And you know that, you know, if you have a big project you have to do, the minute you actually figure out a way to do it, you start to feel better. You start to feel less anxious because you see the path, you know, you see what you can do. So you can use self-hypnosis to do it from the body up, calm your body, and then deal with the problem. You have just shared a very good golf lesson for everyone listening too, because we all get, you know, prior to that first tee shot and or the big round of golf or the final, whatever, we we have it's, it's all this forward thoughts, what might happen and stuff. But just to bring us, be present and, and be calm. be present with your body, and do what you do for your own little child if you were teaching your child to ride a bicycle or something. Fantastic. You know, don't worry about falling because then you'll fall. Think about how you need to connect with that bicycle and be in control of it and get up enough speed to keep your balance up and that kind of thing. Dr. So Dave, you, you focus in the present. Yeah. Dr. David, sorry to cut over you. I was just, no uh, problem. Just, I know I've kept you for a long time. Um, this has been tremendous. I mean, I've uh, honestly me and I'm sure all of the thousands of listeners um, feel like they've been under your counsel for about 45 minutes. So thank you. Well, it begs glad the to question. hear it. It begs the question, you've written like 13 books amongst other things. Yeah. Where can folks find those? Where, where, do, where do they go? Well, the best thing is to go to www.reverie.com. Mm -hmm. That's the Reverie website. We have uh, reprints of my papers, summary of the research, instructions about how to use Reverie to get help with pain, stress, insomnia, focus, stopping smoking, uh, controlling drinking, eating more sensibly. Um, we have a whole bunch of different programs that you can try out. Um, the first week is free. Um, you, if you don't like it, you know, that's fine. It won't cost you anything. Um, and you can download the Reverie app from, if you have an iOS phone from the app store, if you have an Android from Google Play. And um, I welcome you. There you go. To, I've got to my try it out. <laughs> try it out. Uh, and And see if it helps you see if it makes you feel better but we've had you know half a million downloads lots of people are interested in it and using it and uh i hope i hope your listeners will give it a try and 
I'll tell you one example. I, athletics is not my big thing. I, I enjoy skiing and doing lots of things. I was trying to water ski and I just couldn't, you know, you, you get tense, you kind of hold on too tight to the cord. Like and I kept song. face planting in the water. Mm -hmm. And I said, come on, Spiegel, you teach people this for a living. And I hypnotized myself. And all I said to myself was, arms straight, knees bent. I was doing the opposite. I was keeping my knees straight so I couldn't, you know, absorb the the, the bouncing and trying to control it with my arms, which mm -hmm. was making it less steady a pull. Yeah. And so I just arm straight, knees bent, arm straight, knees bent. And you know what? I was up and skiing. So, uh, you know, I, I to, I'm, I'm usually the last one to remember that, that I do this for a living, but it works. Yeah, it's like it's like me when I give golf lessons. I mean, goodness gracious, I don't get to play very much. And I am I've got thousands of swing thoughts going on in my head prior to the time. But your point is so well founded. All the best information in the world amounts to a hill of bean, beans if you can't direct yourself to the job at hand. That, right, that right. And just think of your relationship with your body and how you're helping it and it's helping you. And that's what matters the most. And you've and you've honestly helped all of us. So I'm so thankful to you I'm for so joining glad. us. This has you're been fascinating welcome. and enlightening. And so thank you. My pleasure, Mark. Thank you for having me.